In an earlier session, I said that the digital world gave us a vast amount of information, changing the role of libraries. The digital world has also had a great impact on scientific collections. Most universities have their historical and biological collections, museums of natural history or zoology, and herbaria. These used to be the basis of most biological information and were at the centre of biological teaching. All biology students would have used museum collections extensively. They would have been lectured in the museum and they would have handled the specimens in their practicals. These days, lectures are in lecture theatres or online and most practicals and research are done in microbiological and computing laboratories. As digital databases have become increasingly important, many museum collections have put their information online as digital catalogues and also as image files. In many museums there have been major programmes of digitisation of collections, just as libraries have digitised many of their historically important books. Digital collections have been a brilliant new scientific resource. Whereas in the past you had to visit the museum to examine every specimen you were interested in, now if you study the right species you may well be able to see a high resolution image of the specimen and obtain all the information you need from that. There are limitations though. If you are interested in individual variation you can't study that from photos of one specimen or even of a handful. There may also be aspects that aren't caught by the standard angles, although 3D imagery is now filling that gap. There may also be questions over the identification of the photographed specimens. As museum collections have been made over decades or centuries, concepts of species have inevitably changed and some need to be split into several distinct species. There may also be misidentifications that need to be corrected. A recent species recognition technique that's caused major changes, but has been controversial, is DNA barcoding. Using a standard set of genes, it's possible to assign animals, plants or fungi to separate species. For example, in 2021, 403 species of parasitic wasp were described from Costa Rica based upon DNA barcodes. In that paper, the description was restricted to a photograph of one or two views. It's unlikely that many of those species could be recognised just from that, without sequencing the DNA of every specimen encountered. The development of low-cost portable DNA sequences could make identification quick and easy, and coupled with high-quality photography takes away many of the roles of museum collections. However, as I've said, it's controversial. Not all species are easily recognised from these barcode sequences. If a mutation in a different gene creates a barrier to gene flow between very similar species, that won't show up on the barcode until a great many generations have passed. But they would still be genuine species. We could get around that with whole genome sequencing, but at the moment this, that isn't cheap, quick or easy. So traditional taxonomy through the careful examination of specimens retains an important role, coupled with the newer genetic approaches. Museum collections also have a role in establishing unpredictable connections. For example, the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic was studied using viral RNA samples from living people, livestock and wild birds from historical samples stored in museum collections. Even though that pandemic occurred 15 years before the influenza virus was identified, and well before modern virological techniques, we can understand its virology and why it was so virulent. It seems to have come from an influenza virus in birds, and research is currently investigating its evolution before it infected humans by using bird skins in museum collections that have been preserved for more than 100 years. These findings are then feeding into current research on a universal influenza vaccine. Research into a new hantavirus in America identified its origins in rodent specimens and museum specimens revealed the historical patterns of outbreak. That information enabled public health measures to be put in place, preventing that disease from becoming established in humans. Museum specimens have also proved critical in identifying the chytrid fungus that causes sudden amphibian declines around the world. Soot on bird feathers in museums 
showed that carbon pollution was significant back in the late 1880s, much earlier than had been thought previously. A particularly interesting aspect of museum collections is that their aim is primarily to store material for posterity. This means that some material now only exists in museums. There are species that have become extinct. Here's Cambridge Zoology Museum's dodo skeleton, for example. The fact that these extinct species are preserved means that we can learn about their evolution and their ecology, even though they are extinct. A very large part of my research career has been spent working on the partula tree snails of the South Pacific. The release of a predatory snail on many islands led to the extinction of over 30 species within just a few years. But when these snails were still common, many were collected for museums. We've been able to extract DNA from these to clarify their evolutionary relationships. And I've been able to dissect specimens preserved in some cases over 100 years ago to find out about their breeding ecology and what they ate. Whilst this is a remarkable thing to be able to do with long extinct species, it's much more important than that. Because by understanding the ecology of the different species, and why some of them did become extinct but others survive, we're able to improve the conservation of those species that do survive. I find this particularly interesting as some of those species that survive only in zoos are descended from animals that I collected while doing the research for my PhD 30 years ago. And at present, we're trying to re-establish them back in the wild. The techniques we use combine information from ecological studies of the captive populations, experiences learned from other species, and the historical information preserved in museums. It's a good example of how research combines information from so many different sources, which will be the focus of the last session.